Quite wonderful. So we're looking at Genesis 2 and 3. Last week it was Genesis 1. If you haven't caught up with that, I um, encourage you to go on to the YouTube channel and pick up then with Genesis 1. But what you're going to find that as we go through the study, you're going to see what we would call hyperlinks. In other words, things are connected to things. You, <clears throat> when you start to see these hyperlinks, you will see how they connect further on in, in, in the Old Testament and into the New Testament. There'll be certain parts where um, when you hear something and you go, oh my gosh, I can hyperlink that to so many different references that are that are in the Old and New Testament. So it's just going to mushroom open, but it is going to do even more as we go further on in this. Because what you find in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, all the major themes of Scripture come out. There you find your foundation, your starting point. So if you were doing anything like <clears throat> serious theological studies, you would be required to study Genesis 1 to 11 in order to get a good grounding and foundation as to what Scripture says, because this is the origin of everything, um, where we find its origin. <clears throat> so Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, we're not going to spend an enormous time in Genesis 2, but I want to spend more time in Genesis 3. Genesis 2 is a continuation of um, um, the story of creation, and you'll see what we mean by that. But Genesis 3 is um, about the fall. And there we'll start to see the hyperlinks really springing open. So before we start, let's open in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you that we have this opportunity to study your word. And as we delve into your word and look at what your word says, that you would guide us, that you would assist us, that you would help us to understand and clearly be able to grasp what your word says. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, as I said last week, the book of Genesis in, in, in its entirety would, was written on 11 tablets or scrolls. Now, it doesn't make them individual books. It's just they were put onto 11 separate writings so that you had something that was, in a sense, unique, and, it, and, and, and you knew it was dealing with one issue, then you had the next tablet, the next tablet, and so on. Last week was tablet one. Um, began um, with, this is the account of, um, uh, um, uh, well, sorry, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, Genesis 2 starts with this, from verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth, when they were created, and when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, there's indication of that was the second tablet. Now, what you find in um, historical things is, is that the Jews, in a sense, thought that the second part of Genesis uh, uh, of Genesis 2 was actually a second creation. But it's not a second creation. It's still talking about the same thing. This is setting a scene into which something is going to happen. So let's look at the scene from verse 5. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth. And no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Now, here what we see, ancient worldview. You must remember that when um, Genesis was written, when Moses was writing this down, he wasn't thinking to himself, okay, 2023 in Australia, how will they be thinking? He was writing from his context, the, the situation he was in. <clears throat> their worldview, something exists because it has a function. So my glasses exist for the purpose of going on my face. That's their function. We, in our worldview, go, they exist because I can see them. We don't talk about the function. Now notice what's happening here is that here's the scene. Notice the words, there was no one to work the ground. There was no function. That's why there was no plants, no herbs, no trees, no bushes, no shrubs, nothing. Because there was no one to work the ground. Function. So, so, but it says, streams did come up from the earth and, and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust. Okay, so the dust has no purpose. 
And we'll see that just now when we get into chapter 3. It has no purpose. But God gives purpose to the dust. Now, there's this recurring theme you're going to see. Right in the beginning in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Now the earth was formless and void and the Spirit of God hovering over the deep. There is chaos and God is bringing order into it. But notice he's always present in the situation of chaos. He's always there. But what does he do? Dust has no function. No, no function. So he takes the dust from the ground and he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and the man becomes a living being. So that which has no function, God now gives it function. It gives it purpose. And we know that the purpose in terms of Scripture, and this is where the hyperlink should, should, should start sparking. Oh, purpose in Scripture is that we worship God, glorify Him, have relationship with Him. This is the purpose. So now he creates um, man. So, so this word man in Hebrew is the word hadam, which means red clay. There's no gender attached to this. It's just simply red clay. This is red clay. So it's called red clay. So if you wanted to refer to anybody in terms of Genesis 2 and you say, who are you? I'm, I'm man. Okay, so you're red clay. That's all you are. Um, now he goes on because he's giving function. He's giving purpose. Verse, verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. It was this, this, this Hadam, this red clay, who we refer to as a human being, that he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out the ground. Notice there's purpose now. All trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And now in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now keep your mind on those two. The tree of life you're going to hear about throughout Scripture. Because you hear about it and you hear about it right at the end in Genesis, in, in, Genesis, in Revelation. But it comes all the way through. And this morning somebody commented and said, tree of life. Is there a hyperlink to the cross? I said, well spotted. You just see this constant hyperlink, constantly all the time, this thing flowing of this tree of life. So it's not going to be spoken much about. You can hear it once more in Genesis, and, and, and then it goes into implied. It's, it's in the background, and it's permanently in the background. Everything else is painted on it, if, if, if I could put it like that. But you're going to hear about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and this tree of knowledge of good and evil means that there is the possibility for a person to know the difference between that's good and that's evil. Prior to, to this being there, there is no knowledge of anything that is good and evil. So if you have no knowledge of it, there's no need to investigate it. But there is this place, this place that has a knowledge of good and evil. So now we come into it now. The writer, he wants us to know where this place is. Now, we've lost connection with where this place is, but let's look at it and see it. It says, the river water in the garden flowed from Eden. So this water, river, the garden flowed from Eden. And from there, it now flowed further and it spread into four different headways. Um, it was four rivers. The first river is the Pishon. And um, we go like, okay, where on earth is the Pishon? Um, that's been lost in time. Um, there are two theories. And in a sense, that's all there are, theories. Um, Josephus, ancient church historian from the first century, said well, he believed it was the Ganges. There are others who say, no, it was a river that flowed from the Black Sea down, um, um, down through Iran in, and Iraq. Uh, we, we don't know. Just, we just put it that way. We don't know. Um, the second one, it's, it's, it's in the land of um, Havila, and it is known as the Gion. Now, we're not too sure where the Gion is, but um, the land of Havila, um, there is a um, hint that this could be the Blue Nile, flowing through what is today, present day, known as Sudan. Okay, so, so there is that possibility. 
Um, others have said that the Gion actually flowed parallel to the Tigris. So once again, so much we don't know. But we do know where the Tigris and the, uh, and the Euphrates are. So what we do know is that if anybody wants to say, okay, where on earth was this Garden of Eden? Well, it definitely was in somewhere in the region of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, um, but it doesn't have so much importance for us because we, we can't connect with it. But I would guess that those who were reading in ancient times who knew the names of these rivers um, could connect with it. But we can't connect with it. Uh, then the Lord God took, this is verse 15, then the Lord, Lord God took the man, the Hadam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. You see, function. Now, there's a symbiotic relationship here between this human being and the garden. If he works it, it will provide for him. If he cares for it, it will provide for him. We also get the, the, the whole idea of stewardship, looking after creation, looking after things that are around us. Um, we get the idea of work. Um, work is a deeply theological word. Um, uh, when we get to heaven one day, we're going to work. Um, people might go like, oh, no. Well, do you want to sit in a cloud with a harp all day? No. <laughs> going to work. Work is good. It's important for us to work. And so he's given this ability to work. So he has function. And the Lord God now commands the man. Now, now from this, you're going to get a hyperlink to the giving of the law. So listen to what it says. It says, you're free to eat from, the tree, from, from any tree in the garden. Now, if you're able to keep your mind on that particular verse, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. It's important because there's going to be something about this um, just now. Um, so you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die, or you will surely die. Now there's a hyperlink to the law, because as this tells you the knowledge of good and evil, so the law provides us with a knowledge of also what is good and evil. Without the law, I don't know what sin is. Um, the law was given not so that people could religiously keep it, because it's impossible to keep it. It was given so that you knew why you needed Christ. Because we can't keep it. Now, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is going to, at some point, come into play. Now, one could say, well, did God set Adam and Eve up? Answer is no, he didn't set them up. That, that would not be like God. The thing is that there was this ability to know. Um, a paper that I, um, some time ago, was able to be part of writing looked at that, that, that possibly the mindset that was in um, Adam and Eve was the mindset of presumption. Um, to be presumptuous is to say, I'm sure that's okay. It's not a sin to think, I'm sure that's okay, because that's just part of the temptation. But to act on the presumption and believe that it actually is your right to do something. So let's um, give an example of that. The speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour. You're late <laughs> and you feel, you presume it's your right to go 70 because you've got justifiable cause after all, of course. Thinking I, I could go 70, it's not a sin. You're not breaking the law, thinking it. But the moment your foot hits that accelerator and the needle goes past 50 and is heading for 70, now you have broken the law. So the presumption, I'm sure that I can do it, is actually all right. Now, you're going to see the presumption coming in with Adam and Eve. So let's carry on. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, at this moment, I want to take you into probably call it some very deep theology, but you'll understand it, I know that you will, but it'll also blow your mind. So now you've probably understood um, the Trinity. 
We've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the Father is of the same substance, or the Son is of the same substance as the Father, and the Spirit is of the same substance as the, as, 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 as the Son, and the um, Holy Spirit is the same substance as the Father. In other words, they're all of the same substance, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. You aren't, you're with me. If you're not, be comforted that the majority of the church for 2,000 years is still going to be going, what? <laughs> okay, so this is important because back in Genesis 1.27, God says, let us make man in our image. Now, for us in 21st century, our image, we will go, we'll show me a photograph. I want to see a picture. That's why we have, throughout time, um, there's been the controversies within the church, the making of statues, the doing, doing uh, the, the making of those murals, those icons, and, and so on. Because people have been trying to go, well, what does God look like? Well, go back into scripture and go, well, how did they think in those days in terms of image? Well, when, when the Israelites wanted to know what God was like, he gave them the law. That's what I'm like. Here's a picture of me. This, because I'm holy. This is what holiness looks like. To them, they went, oh, I understand that. We look at it and we go, oh, 10 statements about what I can't do. Thanks. <laughs> See, we're thinking differently. Now, in image does not mean photograph. What it means is substance. The substance of the Father and now, listen to this. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, him is non-gender. This is not woke stuff. Okay? This is non-gender stuff. So, what we've got is, let's just go, the ball of clay. <laughs> okay? It's been made into a person already, but we've got the ball of uh, clay. Now, listen to what is said. Uh, it builds up. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So what's happening here is, remember it said, go and have dominion over the earth or subdue it. Naming something subdues it. You have control over it. You care for it. You look after it. Um, you're in authority over it because you can name it. Just on a side note, how long do you think it took, Adam, to name all the animals? A long time. It depends on how many animals there are. Yes. <laughs> well, it depends on how many, but there's a lot. There's probably a couple of balls. Yes. Lots of different animals. But the purpose of naming them, there's a reason. Notice what it said. No, who, no suitable helper has been found. So go and name these animals. What's he looking for? A helper. A helper, but it's got to be of same substance. Now notice this. It says, verse 20. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So he could not find anything of same substance. Okay, you, you're getting this? Okay, so the Lord, so now God is going to, in a sense, this is a situation of chaos. Um, man cannot relate to animals in the way that he would relate to another human being. Yes, we relate to animals in a particular way, but... Um, yes, I can pour my heart out to my uh, beautiful golden retriever. And he or she will lick me all over my, my face and sleep on the bed with me and do all those things. But, but really, at the end of the day, does my golden retriever really understand? No. My golden retriever, at the end of the day, will just go, feed me, hug me, give me my teddy to carry around. And I will just ooh and ah, but I will not have a suitable helper. So now, God is going to bring order out of chaos. Um, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. 
And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. Now, this word rib, we're going to take note of it in a second. And then he closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Now, there's something in here that we miss in the English. And um, depending on what version you've got, you will notice that rib has got a uh, footnote. Mm. Um, the first word rib that is used, he took one of the man's ribs. That is, in Hebrew, is the word tzela, okay, which actually means a rib, a physical rib. Okay, but then, then he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib. But this is not a physical rib now. Somewhere along the line, between the taking of the rib and now going to be making it, it's changed. It's now meaning a side. It now means a side. And, the, and it's the same word that is used as to a side of something. So, so when you read it, what does it, 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 it indicate when you're talking about substance is that God has to take from Adam substance out in order to create Somebody who is like him, who is a suitable helper, who is substance to keep in the image of who God is. So he takes from Adam and he creates two beings. And now they are male and female. And what he says, he says, and, and, and the man says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. She's of the same substance as man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and the two become one flesh, same substance. The Holy Spirit, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one. Notice the image, the oneness, same substance. Now, as the Trinity is in perfect unity and perfect God at no point is ever, say, lonely, bored. He's not walking around heaven going, I really don't know what to do today. Um, uh, that's not, God is perfectly happy. He's a perfect unity. But we're not talking about three separate people. You almost uh, asked the question, does God have emotions? Yes. Yes. Now, Scripture... Um, uses the idea of emotions for God. And, and in a sense, yes, God does have emotions, but are they human-like emotions or are they on a different level? See, scripture indicates that, that, that um, God does feel, God knows, God understands, there's personality and there are the emotions, but he's also above those emotions because he's transcendent to everything, he's greater than everything. So, 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 yes, he has all those things, but within himself, he's perfectly happy. At no point does he go, oh, I'm bored. So God's desire is that this relationship, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, flesh same substance, this will be the image of him. So you, you're with me on, 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 on this? And it says, um, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Okay, now this word naked d doesn't entirely mean nude. Okay, it doesn't, yes, we get the Renaissance paintings and there they are standing there, maybe nude or, or strategically standing behind a bush and so on. And it's just, and, and we get this image of, okay, they were just naked. No, but there is also the sense of you can see into me and I can see into you and I'm perfectly comfortable. I can see into who you are. And so, and they felt no shame. So this is the sense of the image that God created us in. Now there's the setting of the scene. Now we're going to see the problem. And this is where the hyperlinks are just going to fly out even more. Uh, Now it starts off and says, now the serpent was more crafty, some translations go either cunning or more subtle, than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now remember when I said to you, um, 
Look at that, what um, God said to Adam about the trees. You can eat from any tree. It's, this is what he says. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And you go like, hang on a second. What on earth are you saying? In the Hebrew, it's put forward as a surprised question. Surely God did not say that you mustn't eat from any tree in the garden or from every tree in the garden. It was, he's trying to get into the woman's head. There's that, and I can use it because some of you speak Afrikaans here. I can get in, there's that beautiful phrase in Afrikaans. It's a kop gesmokkel, meaning he came and captured, kidnapped her brain, took it and smuggled it away. Can you also say that he planted the seed of doubt yes. in her head? Yes. Yes. Was did I hear the right thing? That's it. That's it. He's, a, he's, he's got into her head, and now she's starting to f- try to figure out what on earth is going on here. Um, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the, from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat, from, f- eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Okay, This is talking about the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the serpent replies, you will not certainly die. Okay, So the doubt's there. Now he says, now you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Other words, is that what he's saying is that you, as that substance, will be exactly like the substance. You will be like God. What Satan's doing here is that now that he's kicked out of heaven, he's opened up a recruitment agency. And he is now saying, well, he tried to challenge the throne of God and say, I will ascend. I'll be seated on that throne. I will take that that throne. He got kicked out of heaven. Now he's trying to get Adam and Eve to say, well, why don't you think that you can actually just snuggle into this uh, trinity and make make it five of you there? all snuggled up together, and then you can take over. That's in a sense what he's saying, because of the same substance, surely you can just jump in there. And now what happens, it says, um, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate her, and ate her, <laughs> and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, the with her and ate it is the idea of same substance together. What, what the man and the woman were doing is that they were together, but, but um, um, here Satan has come to try to separate them, to break this relationship down so that it doesn't function. In other words, split them apart, um, because he, he doesn't have a united front. So go for the woman, um, try and break this bond down, but at the same time, when this bond is together, what the one does, the other does. That's why Scripture says, says, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will, will, will become one flesh, because what the one does, the other does. What the one feels, the other feels. Uh, we're not talking about some weird type of relationship that um, one lives out of the other. No, it's just what affects the one part of the relationship affects the other part of the relationship. This is now about the breakdown of the very basic core of our society. This relationship that is of same substance is now attacked because he cannot attack this relationship of the trinity, of same substance, and win. So he's going to go for the creation and break that down. Then it says, Then both of their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they realized that they're naked, not just I am nude, but I am vulnerable. See, there's a feeling that is deeper than just being naked. It's being vulnerable. 
and you pick that up with, if you've worked with people who um, suffer from schizophrenia, and you ask them the question, what is it like when you are in a crowd of people and you feel, had that trapped feeling, and they say, it's as though everybody can see into me and they can read my thoughts and I just feel so vulnerable, I want to run. That intense feeling of shame and guilt and, 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 and that everything about you is just not good enough. That's maybe in a sense starting to grasp it. This chaos enters and now they start the first action of attempting to save themselves. What do they do? They sew fig leaves together in order to cover themselves. They want to cover the shame and this guilt and the sense that you can see into me and, and you can see all the things about me that I know that is not right. And I'm vulnerable and I don't like this vulnerability. So they try and save themselves by covering themselves up. How much of that still happens today? That in the midst of shame and guilt and not a sense of knowing who we are, we try and cover ourselves with something else. Uh, it's so prevalent in, in the breakdown of our society where it is, um, I'm not happy in the way that God has created me. I need to cover myself with something else. I need to be something else. Then it goes on, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, okay, so there is chaos. Hyperlink goes back to Genesis 1-2. Um, now the earth was formless and void and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. He's there. God comes into the chaos. He is there. And you will see the hyperlink continuously going forward. And especially um, Isaiah. Um, he shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. In the midst of us. God, God able to reach us in the most unreachable place. You seeing it now? Okay. Now it goes on and says, um, uh, and they hid from God among the trees of the garden. The second attempt to try to save themselves. Trying to save themselves from God. So hide away from God. Uh, this comes down to you know, the mentality of a small child. If they roll a ball and it goes behind something, the ball's gone. If they put their hands over their eyes, all gone. And as adults, we play, as parents, we play those games with children. All gone, okay. And then, ah, oh, suddenly there, and all gone. You know, here's the mentality. If God can't see me, God does not know. So how, do, how does humanity play the all gone game? They, they turn to atheism or, or agnosticism. Um, if I can reason that he's no longer there, then I don't have to deal with this. So behind every atheist and every agnostic is a story of a vulnerability they cannot deal with. And if there is a deity up there who knows what I have done, I don't want him to know anything about me. I would rather remain anonymous, <laughs> hiding away. The atheist and the okay, good, good question. So an agnostic says there is no possibility of a knowledge of God. An atheist says, I recognize that there is God, but I've chosen not to believe him. Okay, so, so um, um, if somebody says, oh no, there's no such thing as God, he, that is an agnostic. Even if they call themselves an atheist, an atheist says, I've chosen, chosen not to believe in God, even though there is, I admit that people say that there is God. But somebody would then say, um, I'm not even going to debate with you about whether there is God. That's an agnostic. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> moving on to verse 10. The man answers, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. So he's calling out exactly what's happening to him, what's going on in his life. Because I've got the shame and this guilt and so on. And, and obviously here, we're realizing that the, um, 
the fig leaves aren't really doing the job. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's hopefully that, uh, that, that, yeah, itchy and scratchy and so on, but they're not doing the job, so they had to hide. <laughs> so you can see the intensity, it's just dropping down, there's an intensity of dropping down, the shame and the guilt is just getting worse and worse and worse. And, and, and then God says, who told you that you were naked? That, who told you that you have shame and guilt and that somebody can see into you? Who told you that? Because you shouldn't know that. Because you were naked and you felt no shame. Now, who told you? Uh, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Then the man said, and this is the third attempt. At self-salvation. The woman you put here <laughs> with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Yeah. Now, this is, in the attempt of salvation, what does Adam do? He, he blames Eve, but she's of the same substance, which means is that you can't blame her because if she's of the same substance, you're equally to blame. But he's not prepared to see that. He's prepared to forsake the relationship for the sake of appearing innocent. And now we start to see, now the hyperlinks should just start to just burst out. Because that's the whole Old Testament for you. That's the reason why Jesus came. Was that um, we pitted one against the other. Listen to the, the second commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You see, the same substance relationship. If the person is of same substance as you, why hate them? Because it means that you hate yourself. If you hate that person, you hate yourself. Because they're of the same substance. You can't hate them. And if you do hate them, it's because you have no love for God. That's why you hate them. That doesn't mean to say that you don't hate what they do. It's because you can hate what somebody does. But the, I hate them. But this now is inherited in. This is what comes in. The breakdown of the relationship. Yeah? Um, I'm a little bit confused here. Um, so, can you say then there that Adam hated God? <clears throat> when he tried to blame Eve. I think that there was a breaking down of that relationship already because he, he had chosen to go against what God had commanded. Yeah. I don't think that, that it had formed into this full-blown hatred for God, for shaking his fist at God, but there was, um, as I said in the beginning, this presumptuousness. I'm pretty sure it's okay. We can get away with it. Um, and surely God will understand that, I mean, the woman that you gave to me, surely he will understand. The thing is, no, God doesn't understand. It's the same substance. Because it would then, God would understand if there had ever been a fallout. He would go, oh, yes, I understand. Oh, yes, we had that um, uh, before the creation of the world when we were trying to decide um, the animals that were going to go, go, in, go, in, go into Australia. Uh, we, had a, we had a fallout. Oh, yes, I understand perfectly. God goes, no, there's a perfect unity here, and he expects a perfect unity here. So if there's no perfect unity here, it's not in the image. And so when the man says, the woman you gave me, God says, no, no, sorry, that's not a good enough excuse. Because it's of same substance. So now he goes on, he doesn't, uh, well, well, he first of all says to the woman, then the Lord God says to the woman, what is this you have done? Realizing this is a massive, huge thing. And then, then, then the woman says, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Well, so not ate the serpent, I, I ate the fruit. <laughs> 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 that would have happened if um, she was Chinese. She would have just eaten the serpent. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yes. <laughs> but, um, so she ate the fruit. Now, so now there is, God doesn't comment. He doesn't say anything. 
But not just, um, um, there is, there is um, God deals with the issue of, okay, Adam, you've, you've, you've done this. Okay, to the woman, okay, this is what happened. Okay, I find out, okay, the serpent. You're the one who's at fault. Then the Lord God says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. Okay, cursed are you above all, all livestock and all the wild animals, and you will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now, the dust, this is important. The hyperlinks will fly out here. Um, um, to eat dust means to eat death. Remember, dust has no function. Unless God puts his spirit into it, it's got no function. We all return to dust when we die. That's it. We all return to dust when we die. So you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust um, all the days of your life. In other words, Satan, you're dead. <laughs> um, and then he puts a death sentence on him. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. There's the promise. That goes through to the cross. Yes. Yeah. That's the work of the cross. The hyperlink there, immediately the hyperlink of all the whole thing of salvation is there. So here we find chaos, God's present, and order comes. Because he gives the promise immediately. Uh, but now he's going to speak to the woman because uh, when he says speak, speak, uh, speak, speak to the woman and to the man, he's going to say something to them. It sounds horrendous what he says to them, but then there's hope. Okay, remember there's always chaos, order, chaos, order, chaos, order. And in the midst of all this, God is always present, present, present. At no point does he go, oh, this is a little bit too much for me. Let me get out of here. No, there's, he's, he's always present. To the woman, he says, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Your painful labor will, will with, with painful labor, you will give birth to children. Okay. In the English, in, in the version that I'm using, it doesn't do justice. If you take this directly from the Hebrew, the childbearing is actually the same word that is used for the whole process of conception. What is being said here is that I will make your pains from conception very severe. So now the pains are not necessarily like, ah, oh, pains. No, it's pains. It's anguish. It's, it's hurt. Any of you ever lost a child in utero? Found it difficult to fall pregnant? Found that there was conflict between husband and wife over sex? found that there was infidelity. And so that is going to happen. Why? Because substance is against substance. The same substance of Adam and Eve, they're against each other. They, 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 they don't want to be with each other. They are now at loggerheads with each other. So the most intimate relationship, they're going to fight over it. And then it goes on and says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So you're going to fight. As much as you want this relationship to be great, you're going to fight. Okay, this is the bad news part. But remember, there's always order out of chaos. Here's, this is the chaos. And then to Adam, he says, because you listened to your wife, it was your same substance, and you did this, and you ate uh, fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat. Now this is what's going to happen to you. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken to dust. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Was is that now think of this is that this is an Egerian society. Egerian society means it's an agricultural society. Everything that centers around everything that they do is about planting and harvesting. If you um, go into a farming area, 
You know, that that's all they think about. They talk about it. They dream about it. That, that's all they do. Um, because life centers around it. So what, what is being said here is that life, as you know it, is going to be against you. And you are just going to find it hard. And for all the days of your life, you are, in, you are going to be up against this constantly all the time until you just return to dust. I, that is, these are two very horrible pictures. Two very horrible. Um, um, they're not pleasing. But then comes here in verse 20. You start to see the order coming again. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. And you look at this and you go, hang on a second. What's going on here? You've just really just told us how bad this life is going to be. Right at this moment, we're just looking for a cliff to jump off. It's like, why even carry on living? There is no purpose. But she's going to be the mother of the living. Why? Well, how else is the Messiah going to come in? How else is... Is there going to be enmity between the serpent and the woman? Something has to change. Something has to be brought into the picture in order to allow them to continue. How is this going to happen? Now we see, here comes the order, and you're going to see the hyperlink again, and it's going to fly out again. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. Okay. How did he make these garments of skin? He had to kill the animals. The animals had to die in order to redeem Adam and Eve. Sacrifice. And a sacrifice to clothe them. It wasn't just a case of God looking and going like, hang on, listen, you, you can't go running around, you're naked. This is a load of nonsense. This, all this nakedness is, no, he's going to clothe them. What does Christ do with the work of the cross? He clothes us in robes of righteousness. God now clothes him with the sacrifice of these animals. God performs the sacrifice. The very first sacrifice that is performed, God performs it. Now, you may have seen the hyperlink already. Who performed the sacrifice of Christ on the cross? The Father allowed it. You see it? Right there. The message of the cross, right there. Adam and Eve are redeemed now so that they can carry on. Because if they, they were not redeemed, then there was no possibility that there would be a lineage of people to go forward. And the woman... Would never, there would never be enmity between the woman and the serpent. Otherwise, between Mary and the serpent. There would not be, in, uh, um, I sound almost like I'm giving Roman Catholic theology. <laughs> I mean, Jesus and the serpent. The, um, um, that um, Jesus would be born. That there wouldn't be the opportunity for that. Because it, it would essentially mean is that they end right there. Because what would happen is that um, when they sinned, they moved into non-existence. Now, non-existence can't carry on. And you'll see um, uh, what is meant by that. Uh, verse 22. Uh, and the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay, so he can't have life because that which has non-existence, if it is given the ability to live, what kind of chaos is it going to cause? Cannot. And that life um, can only be given, it cannot be taken, it has to be given, and it is given from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as it was breathed into the dust, and as God allowed to create man and woman of same, sub, same substance, and, he, and as he sustains it, that life cannot now, one cannot be presumptuous 
and say, I'll go and take it. So what happens is that, so the Lord banishes them from the Garden of Eden to go and work the ground from which he has taken them from. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life so that man would not, with presumption, go, oh, I can go and grab it. He cannot grab it because it can only be given. Life cannot be taken. And we're going to see um, um, the hyperlink that will go with Cain next week, how Cain has the idea that he can take life. You see how the descent just doesn't, isn't a nice gradual slope, it's just a straight down drop. Um, and you start to see the heart of what humanity really is like. Uh, that when we have been made of same substance, we are happy to destroy each other. It means I don't know who my brother or sister is. I don't care who my brother or sister is. What I care about is me. But here, in the midst of that chaos, here is the gospel. God restores Adam and Eve, doesn't allow them to stay in the Garden of Eden because there is the tree of the knowledge, uh, sorry, not, not, uh, the tree of life. And that tree of life we will see all the way through, and then it appears explicitly um, in um, the book of Revelation. But you see it being enacted at the cross and the resurrection. It's not named that, but when you see it here, you go, ah, oh, yes, there we go. There we go. I, I, I can see where it's put in. And then it's named again in Revelation. Great. We'll take some questions. We'll go off camera now. We'll take some questions. Okay.